questions of evolution versus religion, creationism, is it necessary for these two ideas to agree? Maybe underneath that there's a question of is it necessary for Christians to agree on anything? Um, you know, is, are there lots of issues out in the world where we have to wrestle with, um, again, those who are different than us? I was actually thinking the other day about the, the, the text that we had of the Pharisee and the tax collector uh, and that story where Jesus, you know, is telling this parable about a man, a Pharisee, who's saying, thank you, God, that I am not like this sinner over here, this tax collector. And the tax collector is saying, Jesus, have mercy on me for a sinner. And the easiest way to read that parable is, of course, that it is the, you know, that the Pharisee is, is the evil one and the tax collector is somehow the humble one, and we as Christians should, should be humble. But I think the minute we put ourselves in the position of saying, well, thank God I'm not like that person, we have found ourselves on the other side of it. We've become the Pharisee. Um, and I think when we deal with issues like evolution and creationism, I think that we, we tend to do that. We demonize those who are on the other side. Um, and I guess I wonder sometimes if I, I tend to not have this conversation with people. Most of the people I run into, this is not the conversation they're asking. But I think there are conversations, kind of liberal, conservative questions that we ask. And we tend to, 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 to not be willing to hear what the other person is saying and not be willing to find a common ground, find a truth that we might share. I, I think that behind the advocacy of creationism is a hunger for absolutes and a fear of relativism that will end in nihilism. I think it's a complete misunderstanding of evolution and creation. So I think we have to address that elemental anxiety that the world, that the center will not hold and that the world is not reliably ordered. And I, I think that uh, contemporary advocacy of creationism uh, is simply a, a misconstrual of what creation is about in the Old Testament because creation is not a set of givens. It is an open-ended process so that in the Psalms, particularly Psalm 104, all the verbs that have to do with God creating, they are all participles. And that means they are actions that are continuing to go on all the time so that you have to talk about continuing creation and not a fixed point. I believe, uh, to extrapolate from that, I think the same anxieties about the gay-lesbian question have nothing to do with gays and lesbians, they have to do with the sense that the world is falling apart and I'm anxious and I don't know what to do, so I want to draw a line somewhere around some reliable absolute. And what we know in biblical faith is that you cannot substitute absolutes for fidelity. Fidelity is a relational term and we want to substitute certitude for fidelity, and it's a complete distortion of what our faith is about. And I think all of these issues are expressions of that. And how do we confront someone who is so we set talk, in that we, place? We don't, we, don't talk about, we don't talk about creation and evolution. We don't talk about gays and lesbians. It's all right to talk about them. What we have to talk about is the amorphous anxiety that pervades our society because we are living in a time when the old reliables are ending and it scares the willies out of all of us if we are honest about it. That's what we have to talk about. So, so moving beyond the specific issues to the way that they always this, this feelings underneath. that are coming up for That's people. That's right. right. Yeah. And, and I, I think that 
creation and evolution or gay lesbians, I, th I think while they are important issues, they really function as smoke screens to keep us talking about the elemental anxiety that is underneath it. And the answer to anxiety is God's providential care. So in the Sermon on the Mount, do not be anxious, da 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 <laughs> because using patriarchal language, your heavenly Father knows what you need. So it has to do with providence. It ha doesn't have to do with endorsing creationism. It doesn't have to do with banning gays and lesbians, because after we do all that, we're still going to be anxious that the world is changing. So we have to talk about that. Augustine of Hippo, um, back in the fourth century, wrote a book called Genesis Read Literally. He only got through three chapters of it, and it's a long book. But near the very beginning of it, he's making fun of people who are talking about the earth being created in six literal days. He says, well, the first day occurred before there was even a sun and a moon. You can't even have time without things that are moving. So he said, what, what was the first day? And I will, this, I've just got to tell you this because it's so cool. He does a rabbinical move to Job where God says to Job, were you there when the sons of the morning sang for joy at my creation of the world? And by the sons of the morning are interpreted by Augustine as the angels. So he said, aha, the first day, he says, he says, why does God say, and the evening and the morning were the first day? That's weird. Why wasn't it the morning and the evening? Because he wasn't a Jew, right? <laughs> So he said, why the evening and the morning? He says, well, you start with the evening because when God is done creating the angels, they were his first creation because they are the light, the immortal light that precedes the sun and the moon and the stars. They are pure rational light. You'd like that, right? Pure rational light. <laughs> and he says, God creates the angels and it's the evening because then God is done. And the morning is when the sons of the morning, the angels, rise up and say, thank you for creating us. And Augustine says, that's the first Eucharistic act. Because Eucharist means thank you. So that from the very beginning, creation is about Eucharist. And when we celebrate the Eucharist, we are entering into the Eucharistic process that you were talking about. Yeah, the, 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 Jew, the angels must be Jews because the rabbis said that on the first Sabbath, the angels studied Torah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and Torah pre-existed Moses. That's right. <laughs> so it's all if one. He, if he lived. If he, if he lived. If he lived. <laughs> or someone with the same name. I also just want to say that, you know, the, the thing that, that scares Christians about evolution is the element of randomness in it. It's true that the theory of revolution does force us to look at the reality of randomness. But a lot of contemporary Christian theologians are examining the fact that you can't have randomness without order. Randomness is meaningless as an idea without order. Randomness is always an exception. So we can think about how God has created a universe in which there is the possibility for the unpredictable, for the surprising. It's a little, bit, a little bit the same as the problem of having bodies. That we don't live in, a, we can't live in a perfectly safe world if we're gonna have bodies. And we can't live in a world where there's freedom if there isn't unpredictability. So how about if we thought of the word of God, Jesus, as embedded in the universe from the very beginning and in a sense, ensuring that predictab predictability always moves in the direction of the order which is God's love, a love which is made to be aligned with freedom. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Does that make sense? I don't know if it'll make sense to someone who believes in creationism, but <laughs> perhaps.